Hi, it's Matthew Reed here with the second of our Reed Repairs series. And today we have a clock uh, by Smiths, uh, which is signed Enfield. Uh, could be described as a souvenir. You can see from the dial it was printed or made in 1953. And so there are obvious reasons why I was interested in carrying out this repair this year. The dial is screen printed with the, the shamrock for Ireland, the daffodil for Wales, the thistle for Scotland and the rose for England. You can see the case back and uh, back of the dial has its original crackle finish which is nice and very typical for this kind of mid 20th century finishing technique. In order to access the movement we first remove the winding key, which as you can see is normally fixed to the movement, not separate, and it has a left hand thread. We now remove the hand setting knob, which is just a friction tight pushed on fit, and then the two case back retaining screws, uh, starting with a, a bigger screwdriver than something smaller for a bit of speed. We can now lift away the case back, giving us our first view of the mechanism. So it's a very typical kind of alarm clock type mechanism. It has an open mainspring, no mainspring barrel. The clock is controlled by a balance with a flat spiral balance spring, which I can see is loose. Yeah, the pin that holds the, uh, that pins the balance into the stud is loose, which might be part of the reason why the clock stopped in the first place. This balance uh, is brass, it's not compensated, and it has conical pivots. So just plain bearings here, no jewels, not like a watch. So we can remove the chrome plated bezel by taking out these four screws. Oh. That one nearly escaped. And then once we lift the bezel off, we can remove the glass and then the sight ring. And we are down to the, the hands. The hands here are just pushed on to the centre arbour and the hour wheel pipe respectively. So I'm just going to use my brass tweezers to lift away the minute hand. I should have actually placed a small piece of thin card on top of the hour hand to prevent marking. To remove the hour hand, I'm just going to pinch it between my fingernails. You could use a hand lifting or pulling device, or you could lever the hand away, but actually that might risk damaging the aluminium dial. So all the parts in this clock I'm going to wash and then rinse mechanically or manually in a proprietary watch rinsing solution. I'll put a link to that in the description below. So the cleaning you'll see later is with a natural bristle brush uh, and the traditional method of pegging out the holes um, to clean the components. So we have our components soaking which will begin to loosen up some of that old oil that we see. So the movement is fixed to the back of the dial or the disc plate uh, with pins in a kind of traditional way, so we remove those pins and then we can lift the movement away. This reveals the uh, motion work comprising uh, the hour wheel, which has got this little tab here, so it's presumably used on an alarm clock uh, as well in a different iteration. And then our minute wheel, which is retained by a small circlip. Everything relatively straightforward, as you can see, uh, the balance bearing and the index for regulating the clock on the other plate. We've got some um, wear here, which I will get to later on in the video. 
Uh, I was in two minds as to whether I should address this, and I do end up doing some um, some bushing. Another reason the clock might have stopped is because the oil is um, excessive. It's maybe been added to, and uh, it, you can see it's gotten thick and turned green. You can see a small repair mark here as well. The lubrication on the main spring appears to be dry. So um, let's get the balance out. I'll take this loose pin away that's out of the way for safety. Um, get the spring out from what I would call the stud and out from between these uh, index pins if you like. It's just a stamped piece of material, a slot. Uh, unlike the two pins that you'd find on a watch. And then I begin to remove the balance cups using parallel action brass line pliers to minimise damage. We can then lift away uh, the balance cup, this little tab washer, and um, the index and you can see that the whole thing is kind of glued together with old lubrication. Pop these components into our rinsing solution. Now the, um, the balance, you can see the balance spring is retained by a brass collet which is pretty standard for this kind of work, totally standard in fact, and I guess you could actually leave these components together for cleaning, but I want to give the balance spring a good scrub, so I'm going to again lift it away. This time I do use a bit of thin card to protect the face of the balance, and then my brass tweezers to lift the collet away. The collet's quite soft, it's springy, so it lifts away quite easily, and you can see this actually quite a lot of old lubrication holding the thing in place. Uh, we go back to our motion work, removing the circlip from the minute wheel and then lift the hour wheel away. But for some reason the minute wheel seems to be stuck, so I'll come back to that uh, later on. Now I don't have a main spring clamp for this size of spring so I'm going to quickly make one out of some uh, brass and uh, just very roughly scribe a line and then the diameter of the spring as it is in the clock and use a piercing saw to cut out the shape and then finish it by filing. This tool is probably one of those things that I only ever use once so no need to spend too long making it very smart. So I put the movement in the vise gently held between fibre jaws and um, lifting the winding ratchet out of the way in order to release tension from the spring. So before you take the movement frame apart it's really important to get all the uh, power off the spring otherwise you're going to have a bit of a mini disaster on your hands. So we can now see the, the springs fully down and I'm going to use this BA spanner which should in theory be the right spanner for the job but it's actually a little bit sloppy but um, the nuts are not tight so we're kind of okay here. I think the parallel jawed brass line pliers frankly would have been better for this job. We lift the uh, movement plate away revealing our train checking that nothing is stuck to the inside of the plate. Sometimes you'll get a washer there that's stuck with oil, you don't see it and it's easy to uh, lose those components. Thank you.
You can see the mainspring, which as I said before, isn't contained within a barrel. The centre wheel, third wheel, fourth wheel, escape wheel and pallets. So there is our train or gearbox, if you like, of this small clock. We lift the components out one by one, checking that they're intact. But it's a good opportunity at this point, if it's the first time you've disassembled a clock like this, to take lots of photographs and make sketches of the relative positions of things. In fact, when I came to reassemble the center arbor, the clutch, I did it wrong the first time, so easy to make a mistake. I should have looked at my own photographs. So looking at the, uh, the mainspring, we can see that the arbor comes out of the center of the mainspring very easily. But then the arbor, the great wheel and the winding mechanism are really all riveted together, which is an interesting point. The, the manufacturer didn't build in any kind of serviceability of this component. Maybe, in fact, you could buy this as a one assembly when these clocks were um, on the market. And eventually they will wear to the point that repairs need to be uh, carried out, so we'll obviously have to do more sort of destructive intervention then. For the time being, I'm just going to leave the whole thing riveted um, riveted together. So with the mainspring uh, off the arbor, I push it out of this clamp with my safety gloves on, and that can all go for cleaning. So looking at the uh, centre arbour assembly, this is the part of the clock, it's a clutch effectively, that allows the gear train of the clock and the hands of the clock to move independently when the clock is set to time. You can see that little spring, well that is uh, forming part of, the, part of the clutch. So I uh, made a little pusher or puller to remove this retaining sleeve or bush that's pushed on when the clock is made. And it kind of did the job. Again, it's a one-off uh, tool, really. I should have made it a bit more, a bit stronger, but it's, um, it's weedy, but it, it, it did the job. Um, and as I said, I should have taken more notice of the order of these components when I took the thing apart. So next I'm going to t use a watchmaker's staking set uh, to remove the brass pinion from the arbor. Again, you could leave it in place, I suppose, but for thoroughness of cleaning and for the sake of this video, I want to get it off. So I rest the plate on a drilled out uh, stake, which is a bit of hardwood, and punch the pinion out of the center of, uh, oh, sorry, and punch the arbor out of the center of the pinion. That taps out and that's all done. So with our clock as assembled as far as we can, it's time to get to cleaning. As I said, I use a proprietary watch rinsing solution and I clean everything with a natural bristle brush, uh, which is called a Glasgow brush, and then I peg out the bearing holes. Pegging out the bearing holes is a traditional method for cleaning a clock or a watch, in fact, and um, as you can see, you use a sharpened piece of wood, which I sharpen with a knife or with a file at one end, and for cleaning out the bearing holes, I sharpen the other end of the wood to a kind of screwdriver or sort of chisel shaped. Sometimes I'll use a bit of 4 naught steel wool uh, in the oil sinks as well. They're the little depressions in which oil can sit around the bearings to make them uh, extra clean. So, with our components cleaned and rinsed and dried, it's time to begin the reassembly. <laughs> 
So we pop the centre up the back, a little bit of oil on here because you can't easily get to this bearing once the thing's assembled, and refit the brass pinion. Uh, effectively, reassembly is just the reverse of uh, disassembly of this clock. And um, you can see I'm using quite thick oil here, Mobius D5, I think it was, because the clock's quite overdriven. It's got its original mainspring, but that's still more than strong enough to, uh, to drive the clock. So we, having tapped the brass pinion back on, I put a bit of spray grease on the mainspring. I use a liquid spray grease here that contains molybdenum disulfide, again a link in the description before. Um, so with the mainspring back on the arbor, I reassemble that centre friction work comprising of washers and a spring which is all pushed together. As I said, the first time I did this I put it in the wrong order, so easy to make a mistake with these things even when you think you're pretty familiar with them. I'm re-oiling some of the mechanism as I go because, as I said, you can't get to those bearings easily afterwards. It's time to put our train in. We've got our great wheel with mainspring and winding ratchet. We've got the second wheel, third wheel, fourth wheel, escape wheel and pallets. They all go back in, and then the tricky part, which is getting the plate back on, that is getting the pivots into their holes without bending or breaking them, a little bit um, fiddly. But there's no phase of relationship with this clock, unlike a striking train, so it doesn't matter about the relative positions of the, uh, of the wheels. Once the uh, frame nuts are back on, we can wind the spring a little bit and get the main spring clamp off. This allows us also to check that everything is working properly and that the action of the lever, that is the part that impulses the balance, is nice and snappy. We pop the balance spring back onto the balance staff. Uh, we made a note of the relative position of the balance spring. It's important because if the balance collet is in the wrong place, where it sits in relation to the balance staff, then the clock will be out of beat, as in there'll be an uneven duration um, between parts of the action of the balance in relation to the centre line of the escapement. If this is minor, then the clock just sounds a little bit unusual, a, bit of, a little bit uneven, and if this is uh, badly out of beat, then it actually affects how the clock runs. It's good practice, obviously, to have the clock in beat. So we can make uh, small adjustments to that by rotating the uh, balance spring collet in relation to the balance once we've got the thing uh, assembled. So I pop a little bit of uh, thin watch oil in the balance cups, feed the balance spring back through the index and into the stud and refit the pin that was uh, loose when we first took the thing apart. I did wonder about filing a flat on the pin to maybe make it fit a bit snugger, sort of a D section, but 
it doesn't appear to have been like that from new, so I'm leaving it as it is. Uh, checking everything seems to be in order, and that the balance spring vibrates evenly between the two sides of the index pins, or slot, in this case. Now, in a modern watch, this uh, slot would be very narrow, it would be only fractionally wider than the balance spring is thick, uh, but here you can see there's quite a gap, and as a rule of thumb, you would adjust the spring so it vibrates easily, so it vibrates evenly between those two sides of the slot. Now, if we were more interested in um, the performance of the clock, you can adjust the relative position of the spring so it spends more or less time um, on either of those uh, sides of the slot which will change the rate of the clock in um, the long and short arcs, as in when it's fully wound up or when it's let down. So now it's time to refit the motion work um, with the minute wheel followed by our hour wheel and then the minute wheel retaining clip. Again, I'm lubricating bearings as I go along. Uh, I'm using Mobius D5 for the heavily loaded and slow moving bearings, D3 for the faster moving bearings and then watch oil on the escapement. Once the motion work is fitted, it's really time to get the movement back onto the uh, back of the dial or the dial plate, and we're pretty much done. Uh, and kind of onto part two of this video, when I first reassembled the clock, you may have seen it too, but I noticed that the pallet arbor bearing was warm. Um, well done if you saw that. And, you know, in the case of this souvenir clock, although it's obviously been used, the chances are it maybe won't be used that much, who knows, and it's actually running quite healthily as it is. But I decided, it kind of played on my mind, that I would do what we call a bushing exercise, uh, really as an exercise and a demonstration for this video, but to fit a couple of new bearings to reduce that, um, that wear in the uh, in the in the pivot holes so one i'm going to do a train bearing so that's one of the regular wheels that just rotates in one direction and the other one i'm going to rebush that pallet arbor bearing and you can see there's a bit of movement there when the clock is running so looking at the train wheels the although the pivot can move in the uh, in the bearing hole the reality is, when the clock is running, it doesn't it rotates, but it doesn't kind of reciprocate. Um, and as you can see, the wear has taken place kind of tangentially to the driving wheel, which is often the case. So it kind of looks bad, but the reality is, when we're looking at the depth thing, that is the mesh, or the result of the center distance between the two mobiles, it's actually okay and it'll run absolutely fine probably for years and years and years. Um, anyway, so I decide to put a bearing in there as a demonstration really and one in the pallet arbor. Now for the um, train wheel, we're going to return the center or the working center of the wheel to some kind of conjectured uh, position because what we're trying to achieve here is not to take the wear out, that's a kind of secondary part of the operation, but to put the two mobiles, so the driving wheel and the driven pinion, at an optimal centre distance. And I do that with a round section needle file. I then ream the hole round and take a piece of bushing wire. This is hard drawn wire specially made for this job. You could use pre-made bushes but I prefer the wire, it gives you much more sort of flexibility. And um, I turn the wire down 
with a slight taper, drill it out slightly undersized for the pivot and tap the bush into place. Once the bush is in place, I take a five-sided clockmaker's brooch, which is a reamer, a very uh, a shallow tapered reamer, and begin to open up the hole from both sides, so a little bit off one side and a little bit off the other, until the pivot is a good fit. Now in clockwork, in a bearing, you need both what we call side shake and end shake. So end shake is an axial movement of the mobile and side shake is a very small amount of radial movement of the mobile. If you don't have those, your clock will not run or won't run properly anyway. Once I've done that, I deburr the inside in particular of the hole with four knots steel wool on a piece of pegwood and then test that there is that absolutely necessary side and end shake again. If you want to know more about depthing and bushing, we wrote a whole standalone chapter on the subject and you can find that online if you Google depthing and bushing. So I do exactly the same operation with the palette uh, arbor bearing hole but this time I don't need to move the center in the first place because the pivot has worn pretty much evenly I imagine uh, at the to the side with the reciprocating action of the original hole so I ream out I pre-drill my bush pop the bush in open up with a clockmaker's brooch deburr re-clean the whole clock of course because it's now got metal swarf on it and steel wool fibers and then reassemble and test and you can see much less movement to the pallet arbor so it seemed to be kind of quite a nice thing to do anyway so with the clock uh, reassembled all the lubrication checked it's time to uh, put it in beat again by rotating the balance spring collet in relation to the balance as we saw before and then recase refit the hands and we see the clock ticking away with a healthy amplitude. So there we are, the second of our Read Repairs videos. Um, apologies it's taken us so long to get this uh, work out. But the uh, good news is that we now have a reasonable library of content that we'll be working through editing over the forthcoming months. In fact, we're hoping to launch uh, a multi-part uh, repair, clock repair um, video uh, immediately after this one. Uh, so thank you for everybody who's been patient in waiting. And of course, thank you for liking and subscribing. In many ways, this uh, commemorative clock shares quite a lot of DNA with the watch that appeared in our first video, um, separated, of course, by 150 years. Yet so different in many ways, considering this uh, object, the, the uh, commemorative clock, is really a product of mass manufacture and there is the kind of uh, difference if you like one has no interchangeable parts the other one is effectively in entirely interchangeable so that very uh, high tolerance is involved in making this clock which 
um, you know, leads me to uh, highlight the fact that although these clocks are seen as being quite modest, the little alarm clock type things, actually the manufacturing technology behind them is really quite incredible. Incidentally, if you're interested in getting into repairing these smaller mechanisms, then an alarm clock type clock is a pretty good way to get started because they're relatively uh, easily available and the parts are small enough to be handleable, but they're also quite robust as well. So consider that, for instance, if you follow our How to Repair Pendulum Clocks content. You'll have seen in the video that we need to make and uh, adapt tools in order to get the job done. And so I think that's a really important point that uh, if you get into repair, which is what we're here to encourage people to do, um, then you'll also need to make uh, tools as well to get, um, to get through those processes. So it's quite useful to be part of a specialist group, uh, a society for instance, where you can get advice on buying or making tools or something like a hack space can be really useful because there's usually a clever way around uh, these uh, obstacles. From a wider perspective, the clock of course, like the watch, forms uh, a material memory. Arguably, the value of this object lies in remembering. and. There, of course, here in the UK, this has been a particular sort of um, memorable year in relation to the events that this clock was built to commemorate. And there are two sides of this story. One, of course, is looking back, remembering, and the one is imagining uh, whatever the new future is going to be. And although these objects are considered uh, modern, they're often called mid-century modern, they are, in fact, of course, well, in this case, the clock is next year 70 years old. So it's well on the way to being an antique. Um, so again, this clock raises the issue of values. What is considered important? What is What has meaning? And what is worth, or considered worth, repairing, I suppose, is uh, the, the point. Anyway, I'll leave those questions with you. As always, we welcome comments below. I'll do what I can to answer them. And as I said, we'll be back soon with more content on the right to repair sustainability kind of theme. So please, as always, like and subscribe and we will see you soon.